Hello and welcome to episode 16 of my Leaders of the American Civil War podcast. In this podcast episode, we will begin our discussion of General George Henry Thomas of the Union Army. You may recall I had intended to cover General Thomas early on, but at the time I didn't feel quite ready and I wanted to spend more time in in study of the material. The fact is that George H. Thomas was a huge figure in the Civil War, and he had a massive effect on the events and the outcome of the war. This fact has given me reason to pause and spend more time to ensure I got as much pertinent information as possible. Another reason I wanted to take more time is because this study involves my ancestor, Elijah Jones. Elijah Jones was my grandfather's grandfather from Walnut Grove, Mississippi, He was a private soldier, an artillerist in Confederate uh, units from the time he enlisted in March of 1862 until he was wounded just outside Atlanta in July of 1864. Most of this time was spent with the Army of, of Tennessee, the Confederate Army of Tennessee, and he was moved from unit to unit as various commanders changed or were wounded and also as units simply reorganized. What's interesting to me about my ancestor's experience with the Army of Tennessee is just how many times his unit went face-to-face with the units of General Thomas's command. As we will discuss, General Thomas faced off against the Army of Tennessee many times and usually got the best of things, especially in their final battle. Now, historians consider George H. Thomas to have been one of the top five, possibly top three, Union, Union generals of the Civil War. Strangely, though, he's less known than most other top Union generals. In fact, many who aren't Civil War buffs may not have even heard of General Thomas. Why would that be? We will explore this and hopefully gain a better understanding as we go along. He he was a very stoic and private man. He did not write memoirs, and all of his papers were destroyed after his, his death. Therefore, much of what made him tick remains a mystery. General Thomas is probably best known for his performance in the Battle of Chickamauga and for saving the Union Army from annihilation in September of 1863. What may be less known is that he also saved the Army from destruction a year earlier at Stones River and then did the same thing again a year after Chickamauga at the Battle of Peachtree Creek just outside of Atlanta. A few facts about General Thomas. He was in command at the very first major Union victory. He was born in the South in Virginia, but fought for the North, Uh, and this caused his loyalty to be questioned er early on by some uh, of the Union brass, especially uh, Lincoln. He was arguably the most successful general in the Union Army. He's the only Civil War general to have destroyed two armies. Before the war, he was actually quite close to Robert E. Lee and Braxton Bragg. He was obsessed with preparation with doing things right and doing them completely. This was a secret to his success, but it also contributed to his reputation for being slow. He never forgot anything he learned. He may have had a perfect memory. He explored the Colorado River and gathered plant and mineral samples to send to the Smithsonian. While he was at Fort Yuma before the war, he learned to speak a Native American language that was local to the area. His only war injury was an arrow to the chest by uh, the Comanches in Texas. It had actually bounced off his chin and planted in his chest. He was known as completely imperturbable. Much like Longstreet, uh, he was totally calm in battle and was actually quite a comfort to his subordinates in the moment of crisis. His command was responsible for capturing Jefferson Davis after the war He was the first Army commander to use U.S. colored troops in combat in a large, decisive battle, and he was one of the first commanders during Reconstruction to recognize and fight against the Ku Klux Klan. His nicknames were the Rock of Chickamauga, the Sledge of Nashville, He was often compared to General George Washington in his bearing and personality, and as we'll discuss, this was a very big deal to uh, people of the time. He was affectionately called Old Pap or Old Tom, 
and he had derisive nicknames such as Old Slow Trot or Slow Trot Thomas. Major battles that he was uh, associated with include Mill Springs, which was the first Union victory of the war in January of 1862. He was at Stones River. He saved the Army in defense. He was at Chickamauga, where he saved, again saved the Army in defense. He was in Chattanooga, where he destroyed an entire rebel army. He was at Peach Tree Creek, again in defense. And he was at the Battle of Nashville, where again he destroyed a rebel army. Famous quotes that he was known for included, This army can't retreat. There's no better place to die than right here. I will hold this town till we starve. It will ruin this army to withdraw. We must wait till night. And bury them all together. I'm tired of states' rights. And by the way, this came from a southerner. So let's talk about the Battle of Mill Springs. Brigadier General George Thomas was commanding the 1st Division of the Army of Ohio under Don Corlos Buell. Buell had recently replaced Sherman as head of the Army uh, after Sherman had succumbed to highly publicized mental breakdown. Buell would almost immediately uh, come under heavy criticism from Lincoln and his administration for being too slow to advance south towards the Cumberland Gap. This was very early in the war, and the Lincoln administration was desperate to keep the border state of Kentucky in the Union. Any rebel armies operating successfully there would it could encourage succession sympathies, which would doom the Union effort. In late 1861, a Confederate force under Brigadier General Felix Zollicoffer, cool name, right, encamped for the winter near Mill, Spr- Mill Springs on the Cumberland River in the southeast corner of Kentucky, just north of the t- Tennessee border and close to the strategically important Cumberland Gap. Now, Felix Zollicoffer uh, was a pre-war politician and newspaper editor in Middle Tennessee prior to the war. He was actually against secession at first, but when the war broke out, he was immediately made a Confederate brigadier general due to his political ties. His men were all ill-trained, poorly equipped, and not ready for combat. At about this time, a Union force under now Brigadier General George H. Thomas concentrated in the area and had moved to Logan's Crossroads by January 17th of 1862. Learning of this gathering Federal Army, the Confederate commander in the area, which was Major General uh, George B. Crittenden, ordered Zollicoffer to give them battle. Zollicoffer's men attacked on January the 19th in the early morning rain and initially gained success against the Yankee regiments. That's when a strange thing happened. Zollicoffer was a very aggressive uh, fighter, but he was a political general with no military background, so he was not terribly ready, and also he was very nearsighted. He mistook some of the of Thomas's men as Confederates and told them to stop shooting at his men. He almost got away with it, because he was actually wearing a raincoat that covered up his gray uniform. Remember, it was raining, and the Federals didn't know he was a rebel. However, one of Zollicoffer's aides came riding up, firing his pistol at the Union troops, and Zollicoffer was then killed in the melee. The sudden death of their commander and heavy fire from the Federals caused the center of the Confederate line to fall back momentarily in confusion. The fighting raged at close quarters for over an hour until Thomas ordered the Union line to advance forward and on the flanks. This overwhelmed the Confederates, who fled the field in disorder, throwing their weapons on the field and routing. Benson Bobrick writes, The horrified rebels greeted the wall of steel with a feeble volley, then broke and fled. Panic spread until the extended, it extended over the enemy's entire line. That decided the fortunes of the day. One Confederate uh, prisoner afterward told his captors, quote, We were doing pretty well until old Thomas rode up in his stirrups and hollered, Wheel right! Then we knew he had us, and it was no time to carry weight, unquote. No time to carry weight meant no, that they dropped all their muskets and ran. Now, Thomas's force was considerably smaller than the rebels, but he won this battle not just because Zollicoffer was killed. He won the battle because his preparations were very carefully done. This was his hallmark. 
He had pre-spotted his units ahead of time at strategic points and had carefully positioned artillery at locations that would enfilade the rebels as they advanced. He also made sure all of his units had the right weapons and dry ammunition for the battle. As it turned out, many of Zollicoffer's troops didn't even have weapons, and the ones they did have, that did have weapons were armed with antiquated smooth-bore muskets that would not fire in the rain. Now, Thomas's preparations took time and planning, which Thomas really became known for. However, this obsession with planning and preparation would come, come to be used against him by critics who said he was slow. When we come to see this more vividly as we go along, the fact is that his penchant for planning did actually hurt him in this battle. This is because after Thomas's forces rattled, ra- routed the rebels, they fell back to their fortified camp, which backed up to the Cumberland River. They were actually in a trap because um, they were backed up to the river, and Thomas could have closed the trap with a night attack and possibly have bagged the entire army uh, because they were quite demoralized and probably were eager to be captured. Instead, Thomas's plan was to get his units refitted, lined up, and ready to attack the camp the next morning. But that would never happen. It never happened because during the night, the rebel force was able to make a desperate escape across the Cumberland River in boats, Dunkirk style, and make their way to to safety on the other side. When Thomas's units did attack the next day, they found the fortifications empty of troops. In their mad escape, the Confederates had left behind thousands of horses, mules, and all their equipment and artillery. The battle was a complete loss for the rebels, but the main forces had escaped And after this, the men scattered and ceased to be a fighting force. Thomas, which had a force of about 7,000 men, had defeated a force of 12,000 rebels while only incurring about 250 casualties. This would become another hallmark of Thomas's record. Careful planning often led to relatively few casualties. The federal victory at Mill Spring was the first significant Union victory of the Civil War. It not only helped bolster sagging moral uh, northern morale, but also helped keep Kentucky in Union control. This was crucial to Lincoln's strategic plans. Okay, so let's back up a bit. George Henry Thomas was born on July 31st of 1816 in Southampton County, Virginia, not far from the site of the Great Battle of Yorktown just 35 years before. His father, John Thomas, was of Welsh lineage, and his mother, Elizabeth Rochelle, was of French Huguenot descent. His, when George was 12, his father died in a farm accident, leaving a wife and nine children behind. James Rochelle, the maternal uncle, would now take charge of Thomas's education. His family was relatively well off. They owned a farm in the Tidewater District of Virginia with 12 to 15 slaves. But his father had, been, had not really been of the planter aristocracy. However, until his death, Thomas's father had been a prosperous farmer with a farm spreading uh, out of, with acres of tobacco, cotton, and corn. The home Thomas grew up in was a rather large family home of two stories. It was white, and it was set in a beautiful clearing among a stand of ancient oaks. You can actually visit the site today. Now, in 1831, the date of August 21st to 22nd, a slave named Nat Turner, who happened to be a very respected preacher and some believed to be a prophet, launched the most deadly slave revolt in American history. Southerners, for good reason, were terrified by the thought of a slave revolt. Slavery was a very cruel and horrible business, and slave owners had feared that they would someday be held accountable by their slaves. The bloody Haitian Revolution was often cited as an example of what could potentially happen if slaves were ever to revolt. Well, what happened over the course of a day in Southampton County, Virginia, was a small-scale example of this. Nat Turner and his allies killed 55 white men, women, and children as they made their way through the country from one plantation to the next. The Thomas home was near the center of the uprising. 
On the afternoon of August 22nd, Nat's men were drawing near their house when they were warned by a neighbor. Mrs. Thomas and her children piled into a carriage, and as the mounted slaves pursued, George, then 15, drove the horses hard, but Nat's band was gaining ground. When it appeared the slaves were about to overtake them, they abandoned their carriage and they took to the woods. Then somehow they escaped by running through Mill Swamp, across Cypress Bridge, and the bottomlands of Nottoway River to the county seat of Jerusalem. There they spent the night in the jail for safekeeping. Less than 24 hours after the revolt began, the band encountered organized resistance and were defeated in an encounter with, uh, at the James Parker Farm. Following this setback, Turner and the other rebels scrambled to reassemble their forces. The next day, a series of defeats led to the effective end of the revolt. Whites quickly and brutally reasserted their control over Southampton County, killing roughly three dozen blacks without trials. Nat Turner himself was not caught right away and instead became a fugitive until he was finally caught on October the 30th. While in jail awaiting his trial, Turner spoke freely with Whites about the revolt. Local lawyer Thomas R. Gray approached Turner with a plan to take down his confessions. The Confessions of Nat Turner was published within weeks of Turner's execution on November the 11th of 1831 and remains one of the most important sources for historians on the issue of slavery in the United States. Benson Bobrick writes, Thomas had lost a number of neighbors and schoolmates in the Rising, but he seems to have learned a different lesson from that adopted by his state. To Thomas, who would eventually fight for the Union cause, the calamity proved that the desire for human freedom could not be suppressed. It also evidently convinced him that the institution of slavery was, quote, intolerable to the enslaved, unquote, and that the idea of a contented slave under the uh, care of a benevolent overlord was a sentimental myth. By the year 1835, Thomas was preparing for a career in law when Congressman John Y. Mason, a friend of his uncle uh, James Rochelle, offered Thomas an appointment to West Point. Thomas accepted and enrolled in the academy in 1836. Thomas stopped in Washington on his way to West Point and dropped in to pay his respects and thank Congressman Mason. Instead, he was met with a brusque remark, quote, No cadet from my district has ever graduated from the military academy. If you do not, I never want to see you your face again, unquote. This was the same Congressman Mason who would later introduce the bill in Congress calling for the recognition of Texas, which led to the Mexican War. Now, by all accounts, Thomas was a handsome young man, about six feet tall, strong and stout, with fair skin, light brown hair, deep blue eyes, and a square jaw. He was entering the academy at 20 years of age, two years older than most of his other plebes. He was known to be reticent and introspective, serious, dignified, and mature beyond his years. His classmates included Richard S. Ewell, Bushrod Johnson, and William T. Sherman. His classmates would call him Old Tom due to his age and because of his maturity and bearing. During his first year, Sherman was his roommate, and it's believed that Thomas protected Sherman from bullies at the academy. Sherman was a highly sensitive and anxious young man. Thomas graduated in 1840, 12th in his class, and Sherman graduated 6th in the same class. After graduation, he was appointed first lieutenant in the 3rd U.S. Artillery Regiment with his first assignment in late 1840 at the primitive outpost of Fort Lauderdale, Florida in the Seminole Wars. He led many successful parole patrols and was appointed brevet first lieutenant in 1841. From then until 1845, he served in posts at New Orleans, Fort Moultrie at Charleston Harbor, and Fort McHenry in Baltimore. His unit was then ordered to Texas in June of 1845 after Congressman Mason's bill was passed and war with Mexico loomed. In Mexico, Thomas led a gun crew with distinction at the battles of Fort Brown, now Brownsville, Resaca de la Palma, 
Monterey, and Buena Vista, receiving three brevet promotions. He spent much of his time under the command of Braxton Bragg during this time. Bragg would prove to be Thomas's principal antagonist in the upcoming Civil War, but for now Bragg valued his services greatly. His nickname Old Tom was changed to Old Reliable, and he sustained a reputation as an accurate and scientific artillerist. After the war, Thomas was reassigned to Florida until 1851, when he returned to West Point as an artillery instructor, on the recommendation of Captain Braxton Bragg. He established a close relationship with Robert E. Lee, who at the time was the superintendent at West Point, and this relationship grew stronger in the years to follow. He would teach artillery and cavalry during three years at the academy, and his students would turn out to be some of the leading figures of the Civil War. His star pupils included Phil Sheridan, Jeb Stewart, James Birdsey McPherson, uh, Stephen Dill Lee, John Schofield, Oliver Otis Howard, and John Bell Hood. John Schofield was actually expelled from West Point, but only temporarily, and this was on the on the recommendation of Thomas. Now later, Schofield, who himself would become a Union general and eventually Secretary of War, would harbor a very significant grudge and go out of his way to undermine Thomas later, but that's a topic for future discussion. Thomas got his nickname Slow Trot Thomas while teaching at the, the academy. This was because he was concerned about the poor condition of the elderly horses at West Point. Out of this concern for the horses, Thomas insisted the cadets treat them better and not overwork them. This is a nickname that stuck with him, unfortunately. Also, while he was at West Point, Thomas met and married Frances Lucretia Kellogg from Troy, New York, on November of 1852. Lucretia was daughter of a merchant in Troy, and she was 31 years old at the time. George was 36. The couple remained at West Point until 1854, when he was transferred to Fort Yuma, where Thomas had his most grueling and difficult posting of his career, in the barren desert. However, he made the best of this assignment in Yuma. He explored the reaches of the Colorado River and gathered plant and mineral specimens that he sent to the Smithsonian in Washington. He discovered a singular variety of bat there, and with the help of Native Americans, learned to speak and write in the language of the local Native tribes. He was also instrumental in rescuing a little Mormon girl named Olive Oatman, whom some Apaches had kidnapped a few years earlier. Then in 1855, he was reassigned to a new elite regiment created by then Secretary of War Jefferson Davis. This was the 2nd Cavalry, and it was considered a mounted force of the highest grade. Later, Thomas observed that Davis had obviously organized this force as a cadre for a future Southern Army in the event of Civil War. Indeed, the list of officers in this unit was impressive, including names like Albert Sidney Johnston, Robert E. Lee, William Hardy, George Thomas, Earl Van Dorn, Kirby Smith, Fitzhugh Lee, and John Bell Hood. This elite seven, Second Cavalry Regiment was assigned to duty in Texas to fulfill the terms of the treaty that had ended the war with Mexico. These terms included patrolling Texas and protecting northern Mexico from bands of raiding Comanches in that region. Soon, uh, Thomas was assigned to duty in San Antonio and was able to send for his wife to join him, which made the posting much more pleasant than previous postings had been. He spent the next few years on many command assignments, including court-martial duty. This required him to travel extensively with Robert E. Lee to various Texas posts and carry out court proceedings together. Lee had a great deal of trust in Thomas, and the two Virginians became best of friends. It was during this time he he sustained the one and only combat wound of his life. It happened in August of 1860 during a skirmish with Comanches near the Brazos River in Texas. An arrow fired by a warrior deflected off his chin before penetrating his chest. Thomas quickly pulled out the, the arrow, but the wound was an ugly one, 
and left a wedge-shaped scar in his chest. In November, about the time of Lincoln's election, he received a one-year leave from the military to go back home and to see his wife, who had already returned to New York. Things were getting kind of uh, rough uh, politically. While on his way there by train, Thomas took a wrong step off the train in Lynchburg, Virginia, and slid down an embankment, wrenching and severely injuring his back. This led him to consider leaving the military. Although Thomas remained in the service, he suffered from back pain for the rest of his life. Now, when the Civil War erupted in 1861, Thomas remained in the United States Army rather than casting his lot with his home state when Virginia seceded in April of 1861. The decision was difficult, particularly because it caused him to become estranged from his family and friends in Virginia. Also, he must have expected his status as a Southerner in the Union Army might fuel suspicions about his loyalty. But despite any misgivings Thomas may have had, he served gallantly throughout the war, as we will see here. Thomas was quickly promoted to lieutenant colonel and then colonel in command of the 2nd U.S. Cavalry on May the 3rd, when Albert Sidney Johnston and Robert E. Lee resigned to join the Confederate Army. Initially, Thomas served in the Shenandoah Valley during the Manassas Campaign. Then, in August of 1861, Thomas was promoted to brigadier general and sent to Kentucky to train recruits at Camp Dick Robinson. This is when he came to be under the command of Don Carlos Buell in the Army of Ohio and led the successful battle at Mill Springs that we discussed earlier. Mill Springs was a much-needed victory for the Union after constant setbacks they had experienced in the eastern theater of the war. Now, Thomas was present at the Battle of Shiloh as a division commander in Buell's army when it moved to reinforce Grant on the second day of the battle. But Thomas's division did not arrive until after the fighting had ceased. Shiloh was a shocking and gruesome battle which occurred early in the war before people really got to see what the war was going to be like. The newspapers and politicians were demanding that General Grant be fired, and indeed Grant was briefly relieved of his command by General Halleck during the aftermath of Shiloh. General Halleck placed Thomas in charge uh, of most of Grant's army for a short period of time, as the combined armies made their way to Corinth after, after Shiloh, while Grant sat on the sidelines during this time. Naturally, this was a difficult period for Grant, and he considered quitting the army until Sherman talked him out of it. Also, some historians believe that Grant held a grudge against Thomas for the remainder of the war because Thomas had temporarily taken over his command on Halleck's orders. There was clearly a coolness between the two generals that will be present for the remainder of the war, but whether it was because of this incident is very difficult to say. At this point, Thomas successfully led this temporary force as part of the Union march to Corinth, Mississippi, during April to May of 1862. We know that Grant decided not to quit the army and was indeed returned to his own command by Halleck in June. At this point, Thomas handed the army back to Grant and resumed his division command in General Buell's army. However, during the fall, the Union High Command had become frustrated with Buell because of his overly cautious approach and his otherwise lack of progress in eastern Tennessee. At this point, Thomas was actually offered the job at the head of Buell's army, but he declined to take it. Now, this was a horrible mistake that would haunt him for some time. Now, it appears Thomas was incredibly loyal, and the last thing he wanted to do was to undermine his superior officer, Buell, in the middle of a campaign. So, as a result of this, after the Battle of Perryville, Kentucky, in October of 1862, instead of Thomas replacing Buell at the head of the army, General William Rosecrans took over, and the army was reorganized into the Army of the Cumberland. When Rosecrans took over the army, he placed Thomas in command of the center wing. This seems to be the place where all of Thomas's commanders always wanted him to be, right in the crucial center of the action. This was that he was in that position during the Battle of Stones River. Now, to set the stage for the Battle of Stones River, this is the end of 1862, 
in late December on New Year's Eve. Because of Grant's success at Fort Donelson and Shiloh, the Union controlled western Tennessee, and they had also taken Nashville in the center. Grant was struggling to make his way from Memphis to Vicksburg at this time, and over in the east, General Burnside had just lost the Battle of Fredericksburg to Robert E. Lee in disastrous fashion. The Union cause was, again, in desperate need of a win, and the Lincoln administration was pressuring uh, General Rosecrans to take action against Confederate uh, General Braxton Bragg's Army of Tennessee. They needed Rosecrans to relieve pressure from Grant and engage Bragg's army to push them towards Chattanooga and out of Tennessee. Now, at this point, the Confederates still controlled eastern Tennessee, and they really wanted or needed to get Nashville back, so they were pressuring General Bragg to destroy Rosecrans' army of the Cumberland to do that. The pressure felt by both Union and Confederate commanders resulted in the Battle of Stones River just south of Nashville in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. The Stones River is located just west of Murfreesboro, Tennessee, and runs north and to south in a meandering way. The Confederates held Murfreesboro, and the Union forces came down from Nashville to engage them. While the Union Army was marching down to the Nashville Turnpike towards the rebels, General Wheeler of Bragg's Rebel Cavalry made a complete circuit around the Union Army and destroyed their supply chain with over with supply train with over 300 wagons and captured 800 men. One federal soldier wrote, quote, The turnpike, as far as the eye could see, was filled with burning wagons illuminating the pike's whitened surface and the somber cedar thickets by its side, unquote. Rosecrans pressed on arriving in Stones River opposite the rebels on December the 30th, as incoming cannonballs announced they had reached the enemy's position. The Federals faced southeast, and the rebels faced northwest. Rosecrans positioned General McCook's division on the right, General Crittenden's units on the left, and General Thomas's position was in the center. In tomorrow's fighting, General McCook's right wing would get the worst of it. In similar fashion, Bragg positioned General Breckinridge's corps on the right. Now, Breckinridge had been the vice president of the United States before the war, by the way. General Hardee's corps would be on the left. This included Patrick Cleburne's division. And General Polk was in the center. My ancestor Elijah Jones served in General Polk's corps in the artillery under Colonel Manigault, directly opposite Union General Thomas's position. This fact makes uh, the war much more interesting, or this battle much more interesting to me. The armies were about the same size, about 40 to 45,000 men, but Bragg was waiting uh, on his chosen ground and had the upper hand in terms of planning and preparation. By some odd coincidence, both Bragg and Rosecrans had developed the same battle plan, which was to attack the opposing force on their right, right flank, wheeling from left to right. If both armies had executed their plan, they would have rotated their armies around in a complete circle. However, on December the 31st, Bragg's rebels attacked first and fastest and with the most men. Hardee's rebel corps on the left, uh, being led by Patrick Claiborne's division, crashed down on the Union right and proceeded to crush it. Bruce Bruce Catton writes the following, In five minutes, one of the most desperate battles of the war was in full blast. McCook's position was hopelessly swamped, hit from the flank and in front by seemingly limitless numbers. The Union right was lost before the battle even started, if not for the efforts of General Phil Sheridan's division. He had ordered his men to rise at 4 a.m., and they alone had made preparations for the defense even though the main fighting was expected on the left of the Union Army. As the Union right collapsed back towards the Nashville Pike, his division served as a last stand for the whole Federal right wing. At length, however, his division eventually ran out of ammunition and had to fall back to the Nashville Turnpike, and all its artillery was captured by the rebels. Now, Thomas's center position was being flanked on the right as the right wing was being destroyed. Bobrick writes, 
But there, behind a bend in the Stones River, stood a wooded knoll known as Round Forest, afterward known as Hell's Half Acre, where the Federals under Thomas regrouped and made a stand. Now Bragg, thinking Thomas was at his mercy, now mounted, mounted a relentless attack on this rise. Thomas was, in the words of his men, quote, everywhere along the harassed line, directing his batteries to take new position and sur- supervising their fire, standing in the advance lines of the infantry as they blunted the Confederate attack, unquote. Then they went on, quote, the very fact of his presence quietly and coolly giving orders under the hottest fire steadied his men against the storm, unquote. Rosecrans was all also seemingly everywhere throughout the lines directing the defense. However, he possessed a bad habit of bypassing division commanders and giving orders directly to brigades, which often confused matters. This habit would come back to haunt him in, with tra- tragic results at Chickamauga in about nine months. Now Bragg's rebel, rebels continued their attack in wave after wave with Polk's corps in the center now focused on Thomas's federal center. But General Thomas had by now stabilized the center and his artillery and muskets were wreaking havoc on the attacking rebels. My ancestor was in the back of the rebel position with the artillery and they did their best to support the attackers but with little effect. Eventually night came and the attackers broke off. Thomas had held his corps together when all else was coming apart. And, as usual, he remained obsessed with preparation and care for his men and animals. He told a battery commander during the fight, struggling with a broken harness, quote, Keep everything in order. The fate of the battle may turn on a buckle or a linchpin, unquote. That night, Union Commander Rosecrans held a council of war in which he asked each commander whether the army should stand and fight or retreat. The army had been badly mangled, but they were pretty certain the rebels had suffered equally in the confused fighting. A majority of the officers favored retreat, but Rosecrans came to Thomas, who was exclaimed, This army can't retreat! One staff officer recorded the following during the conference when Rosecrans asked Thomas again for his advice. General Thomas, what do you have to say? Without a word of reply, Thomas rode slowly to his feet, buttoned his greatcoat, and from the bottom up faced his comrades and said, Gentlemen, I know of no better place to die than right here. And he walked out of the room into the dripping night. Now join me again for episode 17 in which we will continue our discussion of General George H. Thomas. Thomas.